right, hello everyone. I'm Daniel Roth, product manager for Blazor on the .NET team. It's great to be back here at my favorite developer conference, .NET Conf. I am joined online from across the globe by my good friend and colleague, Steve Sanderson. Steve, do you want to say hello? Hey, yes, Steve here. Looking forward to showing you all what we've been up to. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. We're really excited to be here today to share with you how Blazor in .NET 8 is ready to handle all of your web UI needs so that you can build great web user experiences faster. Blazor is our front-end web framework for .NET. Blazor helps you build rich interactive web apps using .NET and C Sharp. It's part of ASP.NET Core, our umbrella web framework for .NET, and it ships as part of the .NET platform. Blazor is based on a powerful reusable component model that you can use to easily handle UI events, render updates, and set up two-way data bindings. Blazor comes with built-in components for handling forms and validation and uh, displaying large virtualized data sets. There are also great component libraries for Blazor available from the .NET community. With Blazor, you can use open web standards to build installable web apps that can function offline. We provide rich tooling for Blazor with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, including project templates, support for hot reload, and AI-powered code editing. And while you typically write your Blazor apps in C Sharp, you can also interoperate with JavaScript if you need to. So whether you're one person or one team, Blazor helps you build fully featured web apps faster and with fewer resources. You can get started in just a few minutes and then stay productive using one language, one framework, and one tool chain that's integrated with .NET, a supported platform that you can trust. Now, Blazor in .NET 8 is no longer just a client web UI framework. Blazor now has smart web UI rendering that leverages the capabilities of both the server and the client. It's full stack web UI. Blazor now has advanced server-side rendering capabilities with components, including static server-side rendering, enhanced navigation and form handling, and streaming rendering, so you can optimize page load time and really polish the user experience. You can then add interactivity for your components wherever needed, either from the server using Blazor server or from the client via Blazor WebAssembly. You can even use both together in the same app and automatically shift users from the server to the client at runtime to, again, improve app load time and scalability. Let's now go to Steve Sanderson and see what building full stack web UI with Blazor in .NET 8 looks like. If you've used Blazor before, you probably know that we've always had two hosting models available for you to pick from, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. As a quick recap, Blazor Server is a mode where your application is running on a server, probably in a cloud somewhere, and it communicates with the user's browser using a WebSocket connection with SignalR. So it can send the UI in real time into the browser and receive events back from the user. The other hosting model that we've always had is Blazor WebAssembly, where you compile your application in a certain way that lets it run on WebAssembly inside the user's browser. Okay, now those are the two hosting models we've always had, and they're not going away. They are both an essential part of what we're doing in .NET 8 and beyond. But we're now also introducing a third capability for you, a third hosting model called static server-side rendering. And this is in some ways the simplest of the three modes. All we have here is your .NET application running on a server somewhere and to communicate with the user's browser, it just does the most traditional thing that web servers have always done. It takes HTTP requests coming in and it replies with some HTML. But you still get to use the Blazor component programming model, and except now you don't have to use either WebSockets or WebAssembly. So what is static server rendering good for and what kinds of things would you want to build with it? Well, one thing it's extremely good at is scale. It's great for reducing the load on your server because you don't need to have any WebSocket connections with each user. And it's great for reducing the load on your end users because they don't need to download any WebAssembly files. So you can serve your application much faster and more cheaply than you might have been able to in the past. 
Secondly, it's really good for sites that are mainly about presenting information. So mostly read-only public websites, things like blogs, e-commerce, search engines, things where the user is mostly coming to read information. And the kind of interactions that users can have with your site then are what they traditionally have in HTML, which is navigating around through links and entering data in forms. And many web applications can be built this way. Now, there's a couple of things that it's not really so good for. For example, it's not a way of having arbitrary interactivity, the sort of thing that you would think of as a single page application, rich event handlers. And it's also not good as a way of pushing real time information to the user because there's no code running in the user's browser after the page initially loads. But don't worry, if you want to do either of those last two things, you absolutely still can because we allow you to mark any component or page as running on Blazor server or WebAssembly for full interactivity. And I'll show you that later in this talk. Let's have a look at this in action. Here's an example of an e-commerce site, the sort of thing that is really good to build with Blazor's static server rendering feature. This comes from the eShop sample that you'll see in various talks in this conference, and you can get the code and have a look at it yourself. Uh, but let's just see what the user could do with this application. Well, they could explore and try and find some products. They could search by different brands, uh, or they could look for particular types of products. Let's see, imagine I want a jacket. Uh, well, I really like the look of this colorful one here, so I'm going to add that to my shopping bag. Uh, in fact, I like it so much, I'm going to add a couple more. Then I'll go into my shopping bag and I'll realize that it, I don't really want three of them. Let's just have one. I'll update that. I could go into checkout. And of course, I've got all the kind of validation features that you'd expect on a page like that. Right, so how is that implemented? Well, you won't be surprised to learn that that is implemented with Blazor. Uh, so let's look a little bit of code in there. Uh, here's the code for the catalog page that we just saw that was used on the home page. And this uses the same Blazor programming model that's always worked with Blazor. For example, the same kind of lifecycle methods. Uh, when this page gets initialized, it's going to uh, use normal .NET code to fetch some data from a backend data store. And that populates this catalog result here. And then if we scroll up here, you can see we've got normal Razor syntax to loop over all of those items and display a Blazor component for each one of them. OK, so it's the traditional Blazor programming model, but it's not using WebSockets or WebAssembly. It's just statically server rendered. How does that work then? How do we tell Blazor to do static server rendering? Let me show you how this works. Imagine you're building a website like this. It's got a few different pages in it. Some are for the general public, some are for admins only, some are static, some are interactive. Now, if you were doing this with Blazor before .NET 8, you would have to decide upfront whether it's Blazor Server or WebAssembly. And whichever one you chose, that would apply to the entire application. So every single page would be coming out of either Blazor Server or WebAssembly, depending on which one you've picked. Now, this approach is still available in .NET 8. It's not going away. Your existing applications can just be brought forwards and can carry on working this way if you want. We now call this global interactivity. It used to be the only option, but from .NET 8 onwards, it's not the only option anymore. So as of .NET 8, if you're building the same site, then by default, each page in it would be rendered using static server rendering. So that's the simple, cheap option. And whenever you want, any individual page or component can be marked as requiring interactivity with either WebAssembly or server. And you can choose that on a per page or per component basis, and everything works together in a single site. And this new pattern is now what we call per page or per component interactivity. Being able to render HTML is, of course, great, but we didn't just want to stop there. We've gone further by adding various enhancements on top of server-side HTML rendering to allow you to produce a better user experience than would normally be possible. So I'll show you each of those features now, starting with streaming server-side rendering. This allows you to render the page before you've even loaded the data that needs to go onto it. So if you've got some long running database query or some API call that you would normally need to wait for, well, traditionally, you can't return the HTML until you've got all the data that needs to be in it. But with streaming rendering, we can skip that process, render the initial HTML straight away, and then stream updates into it as the data becomes available.
And in fact, you've already seen that because we were doing that inside this e-commerce site. If I go back and start looking through different brand options or looking through different types of products, you may notice that each time I navigate, I see this loading sign appears at the top there while I'm waiting. So how is that even possible? Traditional HTML can't display states while it's loading. It can only just display the final state. So to understand this more, I'm going to switch over to a much simpler example, almost the simplest possible thing that I can do uh, over here. So all I'm going to do in this very simple example is display a count that increases over time. So it's Blazor and when the page first starts, we've got a count and we're going to loop five times and each time we're going to wait for one second, we'll increase the count and then we'll trigger a UI update. Now, the only reason I have to call this is because I want to show all the intermediate states. If you just want to show the first and last state, then you don't actually have to call this. So normally you wouldn't. But in this case, I want to show all the states. So if I compile that and I run that inside my browser, what am I going to see? Well, I'll come over here and I'm going to start it loading. And I don't actually see anything. I'm just waiting. And I'm going to have to wait for a full five seconds before eventually it just displays the final state. So that's how traditional server rendered HTML works. You will only see the final state. And we can see that even more clearly if I load this in curl on the command line. When I start that going now, we just have to wait and wait and wait for five whole seconds before eventually we just see the final state. The count is five. Okay, now watch what happens if I enable streaming rendering. I'm going to put an attribute here, stream rendering, okay? And then I'm going to go back into curl on the command line and hopefully we will see that behave a little bit differently. So I'm going to start that running again. And this time you see, we actually get the initial response immediately saying that the count is zero and it goes through all the different counts uh, start ending up with the final count of five. So what does that actually do inside a browser? Well, if I reload here, you'll see I see all the counts and they increase and it updates the UI each time some new bit of information is available. Now, Blazor knows about all the tasks that you're waiting for. It knows which bits of the UI have changed after each task and is able to send a minimal UI update to the browser, all part of the same HTTP response. So that's what's happening here inside this e-commerce site. Each time we navigate, we're displaying different intermediate states of the UI rendering until all the tasks are complete and we're able to render the final state. So in summary, this allows you to do an initial fast UI update without the user having to wait for all the queries to take place in the background. And it also has a different technical benefit, which is that the browser can start fetching all the static resources like CSS or JavaScript, whatever else you're using at the same time that those database queries are happening on the back end. Now, you might wonder why we didn't just enable this by default for every page. Why did I have to add this attribute explicitly? And the reason is that you should only put this on pages when it actually makes sense. Uh, you don't want to really put this on a page if the loading is only going to take a microsecond anyway, because then the user will just see this strange flash of loading that instantly goes away. So you should only really use this if the loading is going to take a few seconds at least. And you might want to render some sort of sensible loading state like a spinner or uh, like a placeholders for different parts of the UI. So it's up to you to decide how things should look while it's loading. So you do still need to do a bit of UI design around that. Another feature of static server-side rendering in Blazor in .NET 8 is to do with navigation. And it's about making your site feel faster, snappier, and more responsive to your end users. In fact, it's about trying to make your site feel as responsive as a single page application, even though it's using traditional server-rendered HTML. So again, I'll show you. And once again, you've already seen it because it was already inside this e-commerce site, but you wouldn't really have been able to tell. Because this is running from localhost, it's all kind of instantly fast anyway. You can't really see what difference it makes. So to understand this a bit more, again, I'm going to switch over to an even more basic example so we can see exactly what's happening on the network and exactly what's happening inside the DOM. So this is about the simplest page I can make that still has navigation in it. And if we have a look in the browser's network tab to see what requests are happening, when I reload this, you'll see that the page has to do three requests to load. There's some HTML, some CSS, and some JavaScript. Right, now, 
When I navigate from one page to another, with a normal server rendered site, with traditional HTML that is, the browser would throw away the entire page and recreate another one from scratch. And that's why it feels slightly slow, slightly jerky compared with a SPA technology. But in this case, we've got enhanced navigation on, which is on by default. So when I click on the about link, the browser doesn't actually discard any of this information it's already got. It only has to do a single extra HTTP request, which it does using fetch, and then it swaps that content exactly as it is into the existing DOM. And if I navigate back to home, then you'll see that it's just done one more request and swapped it in place. Now to really prove that we're retaining the DOM, I'll switch over onto the elements tab here and expand this a little bit. Now, as I click backwards and forwards, if you keep your eye on the elements tab on the right there, see which parts of it are flashing and which parts aren't. The flashing parts are the bits of the DOM that are actually changing. And so you can see that all the other parts, the navigation header, the scripts, the head, everything that hasn't changed is being left alone. And that allows the browser to do the UI update much faster than it would normally do. Okay, now as well as just retaining the DOM, we have some other functional practical benefits to what's going on here uh, in terms of controlling how the UI state changes. So if I start putting stuff into this search box, let's say I want to search for hello. Now, when I click on the about link, watch what happens to that search box. Well, it gets reset back to nothing. Why is that? Well, because it should, right? Because the about page, in fact, every page has got an empty search box by default. And so every time I navigate, it's going to update the DOM to match what the server says the DOM should look like. And by default, the search box should always be empty. But what if I want to retain the contents of that? Now, traditionally, that would be hugely difficult. You would have to store the data in local storage or something painful like that. But because of enhanced navigation, I can mark any part of the DOM as being retained during navigation if I want to. So let's go and have a look at the code here. Here is my navigation menu that we've got here. And on this form with a, a box inside it, I'm going to add an extra attribute. I'm gonna put data-permanent. That's a Blazor specific attribute, and that is tells the enhanced navigation system not to replace the contents of this element when the user navigates. Okay, so now if I search for something, okay, and then I click on the about link, notice how the contents of that text box are not removed anymore. So as a developer, you can control which parts of your page are retained during navigation, which is not something you could traditionally do with static server rendered HTML. So in summary, this is a way of making navigation complete faster because the browser doesn't have to do as many HTTP requests since it can retain all of the static resources that it's already using. It also allows the browser to retain most of the DOM elements, which again reduces the workload on the browser and makes the UI feel snappier. You also get full control over which parts of your page have this feature. It's on by default, but you can easily turn it off at any level in the tree if you want to. And the sort of reason why you might want to do that is maybe you're doing some navigation to a page that is going to load some JavaScript that's incompatible with JavaScript that's already on your page. In that case, you might actually want to reset the page and hence turn off Enhanced Nav for that one particular link. But the point is you have total control over where this feature applies and where it doesn't. The next feature of static server-side rendering to talk about is forms. And that is of course how you can accept some input from your user. And the intention with the design here is that you should have all the same features that you might know from Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly, and they should also work with static server-side rendering. And in fact, in just about all cases, it's even the same APIs. So you can even share code across all the different hosting models. Let me give you an example of that. And like before, I'm trying to make the simplest example that I can. So pretty much the simplest form you can have. We've just got a couple of fields, uh, one name and one price, and you can click submit to submit that form. And the way that works in terms of the code is like this. So if you already know how forms work in Blazor, you'll know it's the same thing. So we've got the same edit form component, the same input components here. It uses the same binding system. Uh, we've got the same validation system with data annotations validator. And we've got our onValid submit here wired up to save product async. And so if it's a valid product, then we will add it to our data store and set this message that says product added. So let's try it out. 
back in the browser, I'll try and submit a blank form. And of course, validation is applied. And if I enter something uh, to make the form valid and I hit submit, then you'll see now the form post is accepted and we get our product added message. Okay. Now, in terms of new APIs, when you're doing static server side rendering, you do have to give a unique name for each form that gets submitted. That's because you could have multiple forms on the page. And when an HTTP post request comes in, the server needs to know which one you're trying to run the submit handler for. So that's what that is for. And then the other new bit of API is this attribute supply parameter from form. And that allows you to bind incoming HTTP post data to a particular .NET object. So it's up you to control how the incoming post data gets mapped onto your objects like that. But apart from that, it's the same APIs and it should work as you expect. Now, if those were the only features of static server-side rendered forms, then it would be kind of boring because that's just what web developers have already been doing for decades. But don't worry, we've added some advanced features that allow you to produce better user experiences than would normally be possible. And this works by integrating with enhanced navigation and with streaming server-side rendering when you're posting your forms. Let's show you that. So by default, form posts are not enhanced. They throw the whole page away and create a new one. Let me show you. First, I'll type some stuff into this search box something and I will submit my form and watch how many requests are made. So I'm submitting now and you can see that the browser has done three requests. It's refetched all the static content and it's reset that text box because it's not enhanced. And the reason it's not enhanced by default is that post requests are kind of more sensitive than get requests. We can't retry them if anything goes wrong. And we don't know if the endpoint on the server is a Blazor endpoint or is going to redirect to a non-Blazor endpoint that can't handle it. So you have to explicitly mark your form as using enhanced post if you want that. So I'm going to do that on my form there. And when I go back to my browser now, we'll do the same thing again something in here. Okay, and then I'll type into my form and I'm going to clear the network trace. I'll click submit. And this time you can see that it's only done one HTTP request and it didn't lose the contents of my search box. So that's how it's integrated with the enhanced navigation system, which makes the responsiveness a little better. The other thing is how it integrates with streaming rendering. Now notice that this form takes a little bit of time when it submits. I've deliberately added a delay on the server. Uh, so that's why I click and then I have to wait for a full second before this shows up. Now, can we use streaming rendering with this? Well, yes, we can. So I'm going to add the streaming rendering attribute here. And now to show you that does something, I'm going to add another message that happens immediately before we start saving changes. So I'm going to put saving dot 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 in there. So now back in my browser, let's get rid of this because we don't need it. Okay, I'm going to enter yet another thing and a price. And when I hit submit, notice we instantly see saving appear and then product added after it's finished saving. And that's using streaming rendering. So this starts to create a really nice user experience. It's a form that when you submit it, you get instant feedback, even while the operation is taking place. And the browser is able to retain whatever parts of client side state we want. So you get all the same user experience benefits as with a single page application, but without having to use a spa technology. So now finally, I can show you the full power of full stack web development with Blazor on .NET 8. Blazor has always been about creating rich, interactive user experiences, and that is very much still the case with .NET 8 and beyond. So even though you may be able to build many parts of your site in a very fast and cheap way with static server-side rendering, there very likely will still be some parts where you want to use full interactivity. And the great news is it's very easy to do because this is deeply integrated with the whole system. To see this in action, let's go back to the eShop sample application. And you may have noticed this little speech bubble in the bottom right hand corner. If I click on that, then an interactive component is dynamically added into the page. And in this case, it's running on the Blazor server hosting model, but it could also be WebAssembly if we wanted. And this is an interactive chatbot, which is powered by the Azure OpenAI service. So I can start typing what's up and it's going to reply to me using AI and it can even do things like search the catalog. So what bags do you have? 
It's going to go and look in the catalog for me and hopefully make some recommendations to me when it's finished thinking. There we go. Got some nice pictures and everything. All right, so let's tell it. Actually, I'll come back to that in a minute. The other thing I want to show you is that the state of this is preserved even as we're navigating around different statically server rendered pages. So as I move between these different pages here or I click on different categories, notice that I don't lose the state of my interactive component. That can be preserved during enhanced navigation. The other thing to know is that interactive components can cause statically rendered content to be updated. Um, notice that I don't have anything in my cart at the moment. In the top right, you see I have the cart icon with no numbers next to it. But I'm going to add something to my cart from the chat bar. So add the first bag to my cart, like that. And the chat bot is able to add stuff to my cart and it's also able to trigger an update of statically rendered content directly from the interactive component. Now, if you're wondering how the code for that looks, how does interactive components update statically rendered content? Well, it's pretty simple. Here we are inside some code for the chat bot and this is where it adds items to the basket, as it calls it. And I simply have to call navigationmanager.refresh and that will reload any static content that's on this page that we're already on while preserving interactive state on that page. All right, so there's quite a lot to take in here. I'm going to show you a simpler example in a second, but just to set your expectations, how this works is for any page or component, you can mark it as running on server or WebAssembly or even both if you want to. I'll get to that in a minute. And it's deeply integrated into the other parts of static server side rendering. It works with enhanced navigation, so it doesn't lose your interactive state as you're moving around and it knows how to open and close WebSocket connections to the server as required. So we call them circuits when you're connected to Blazor server. If you go onto a page that's using one of those components, it will make the connection to the server. And if you then do an enhanced navigation away, it will close that connection. So you only have to keep the connections open for as long as they're required. And that minimizes the amount of server side resource consumption. To understand this a little better, let's switch back to our simpler application and add an interactive component to it. Over here on the About screen, you can see I've added this little note saying that we want to add a calendar, and here it is in the source code too. I've already got a calendar component which is built to work with either Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly. Here's the sources for it. We're not going to read that in detail. It's a bit complicated, but it uses lots of event handlers to make things nice and interactive. Let's add an instance of that onto our static server rendered page right here. Back in the browser, let's reload and see what we see. Well, what we see is a calendar. So it looks like it should do. Uh, our interactive component is here being rendered in the middle of a statically server rendered page, but it's not actually interactive. We can scroll around, that works fine. But if I try and drag these items around, well, they won't drag, it, it's not doing it. And if I click on things, well, again, nothing is happening. And the reason for this is because by default, all Blazor components, all existing ones can be used in a static server rendered page, but they just don't have interactivity because they can't. There's nothing interactive in a static server rendered page. If you want to make them interactive, you opt in on a per page or per component basis. Let's do that with this component right now. I could, if I wanted, go into the source code for this component and add a render mode directive right here. And I could say interactive server or interactive web assembly or even auto. We'll get back to that in a minute. But maybe you don't want to edit this component or maybe you can't. Maybe it's someone else's component. Another way to do it that's possibly better is you can add the render mode at the place where you use the component. So in this case, I'm going to say this calendar instance is going to run interactively on the server. Let's try that out. Now that's an interactive component. It looks the same, it behaves the same as I scroll, but now I can start to drag things around and I get all the interactive features that I might want. So I can pick different items, I can hit save. I get all the features that we should do, validation and everything else is all running interactively on the server now for that one particular component. The other thing to see is how it's smart enough to open and close connections to the server on demand as the user navigates around. So if I start here on the home screen and we'll have a look to see how many WebSocket connections we've got, you'll see we've actually got zero at the moment because there's no interactive server components on this page. 
If I do an enhanced nav over to the about screen, then you'll see it does start up one WebSocket connection to the server, and that will be used for as long as there are any interactive server components on the page. If the user does an enhanced nav and after it there aren't any on the page anymore, it will automatically close the WebSocket connection. Now you can't really see on the browser dev tools that this connection has been closed, but it has, and you can kind of see it if I go back to the about screen because it will create a new connection to replace the old one that had been closed. So there you go, it opens and closes the connections as required to support your interactive server components. Now, running components interactively on the server really is as easy as just adding this attribute onto the component. Basically, any component is just going to work interactively on the server if you do that. But what about if you want to run on WebAssembly? Well, that involves a couple of extra steps, and I'm just going to show you that right now. So I'm going to switch this component over to interactive WebAssembly, and it won't actually work at first, but let me show you what error we get. Here in the browser, it might look as if it's working, but this is just pre-rendering, and all the interactive features actually aren't operating. If we have a look inside the DevTools, you'll see we've got this error saying that the calendar could not be found in the assembly. That might seem a bit strange because it is in my assembly, so why can't you find it? Well, the answer is, when you're running code on WebAssembly, you have to send that code to the browser, and it's up to you, the developer, to decide which parts of your application should be sent to the browser and which should not. And the way that we arrange that is by having different projects. So here in my solution, I've got two projects, one that runs on the server and another one that's compiled for WebAssembly and runs on the client. And unless your component is in that client project, then of course it can't be loaded on the WebAssembly side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my calendar component and I'm going to simply drag it, including everything that it depends on, into the client project there. And in fact, I can delete the one from the server because that won't be used anymore. Okay. And once that's done, I can go back into the browser. And when that comes back up, this time, instead of an error, it won't have an error and all the interactive features will be back. And now they're actually running on WebAssembly. So that's adding interactive components to your site. Now it's Perhaps obvious, but I'll say it anyway. If you're going to use interactive components, then that means you'll either be using a WebSocket connection, if it's server mode, or WebAssembly files, if it's WebAssembly. And in some ways, these two are a trade-off against each other. With the server mode, your site starts immediately, but it consumes some server resources. Whereas with WebAssembly mode, your site doesn't consume server resources while it's running because it's in the browser, but it doesn't start as fast because the user has to download those files. So is there some way we could use both of these together to get the best of both worlds? And that brings us to the final render mode, which is called auto mode. This allows you to use WebAssembly, but without the user having to wait for it to download in the first place. How does this work? Well, initially when each user arrives, it will use the Blazor server render mode while it's downloading WebAssembly files in the background. And then the next time the user comes, it will be able to use WebAssembly without consuming any server resources. Now, a requirement for that, of course, is that your component has to be able to work on WebAssembly in the same way that we talked about before. But assuming that it does, then you can use auto mode. So let's try it out, shall we? I'll switch back over here and I'm going to change this calendar to run on the interactive auto render mode. Now, let's see how that behaves inside the browser. Let's have a look and I'll hit reload, then we should see that it's using the server hosting model initially so that it can start immediately without having to wait for WebAssembly files to download. But in the background, it will have downloaded those WebAssembly files. So if I hit the reload button now, the next time it comes up, you'll see there's no WebSocket connection in the browser. And if we look on console, you can see it's logging this information about the fact that we're running on WebAssembly now. And of course, everything works. All right, that is the auto render mode. So in summary, with .NET 8, Blazor combines the full power of the server with the client. This means you can use static server-side rendering for maximum scale with enhanced navigation and streaming rendering for a better user experience. And when you need full interactivity, you can enable that for any individual component or any part of your application. Now back to Dan. Awesome. Wow. Thank you, Steve. That looked amazing. OK, so how can you now get started building full stack web UI with Blazor in .NET 8? 
Well, it's easy. You can use the new Blazor web app template that's included with the .NET 8 SDK and with Visual Studio. This new template gives you the best of Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly in a single solution. It's set up and ready to go with static server-side rendering and all of the new progressive enhancements. And you can also easily enable the new interactive render modes, server, WebAssembly, and auto. Let's go and check it out. OK, I'm going to hop over here to Visual Studio. I have the latest version of Visual Studio installed. And we're going to create a new project. And of course, we're going to use the new Blazor web app template, which is right here. This single template has everything you need to build Blazor apps with .NET 8. Let's go ahead and select that. We'll choose the default uh, project name. And now we have a few options here. Well, first of all, by default, the Blazor web app template is set up for server-side rendering, both static and interactive. But we can choose to instead use uh, interactive WebAssembly rendering if we want to do the rendering from the client. Or we can enable both, and that will enable uh, using the new auto render mode. Like, I, I want all those features, so I'm going to select auto. We can also choose how much interactivity do we want in this app. Do we want it per page or component? Or do we want the whole app to be interactive? For this demo, I'm going to pick per component. So we'll go ahead and create that. All right, so now we've got our solution with the two projects. This top one is the server project, and the bottom one is the client. That's the bit that's going to run client side and the browser on WebAssembly, and the server's going to handle all of our requests. Let's take a look at Program CS in the server project. Up here at the top, we're registering all the services that are required to render Blazor components uh, from the server and the new interactive render modes. Down below, we can see that we are setting up. Uh, the our Blazor components to be routable endpoints using ASP.NET Core endpoint routing. By calling this map razor components, this will discover all of our routable endpoints and set them up as endpoints. Now, we've also are uh, specifying our, uh, our root component, this app component right here. Let's go take a look at that. So here's app.razor. And here we can see that this is where we're rendering the root HTML document for our application. We no longer need a Razor page or a CSHTML file to bootstrap our Blazor app. We can use Blazor components for our entire application. Uh, your root components will be statically rendered from the server. This component is also setting up the Blazor router, which works together with endpoint routing to route requests to all of our components. And we're also adding the new unified Blazor script. OK, we have some pages in this app as well, the usual suspects. We have our home page, which just has some static HTML content. We also have this weather page, which we can see at the top is using the new streaming rendering feature that Steve showed us. That means this component can render immediately with some placeholder content while it goes off and gets the weather forecast data. Then when the data has been retrieved, it can send a streamed update down to the client with the weather forecast information. Now, it's not, honestly, it's not actually going and calling an API to get the, the weather data. It's doing a, a simulated API, API call with this task.delay uh, as if we're making an API call that might take a little while. OK, and then we also have our counter component, which is over here in the client project, because it's going to need to run on WebAssembly. And this is using the new interactive auto render mode. All right, let's go ahead and run our Blazor web app and see what it does. See all those features in action. There it goes. OK. Get it up and running. All right, so here on the home page, we just should have some static HTML. We can see that really quick if we bring up the, the browser Brett DevTools. And let's just refresh. If we look at what was retrieved from the server, we just have some normal static HTML content, like there's the hello world, welcome to your app. So no WebSockets, no WebAssembly here. But if we go to the counter component and we filter on WebSockets, we can see that we now do have a Blazor WebSocket being set up. And that means that we can click on the counter, the count goes up. So this is currently using interactive server rendering. And uh, we can see that the WebSocket connection is actually currently active because the request is still pending. It hasn't completed yet. But if we browse away from the counter component, 
and go back here, we can see, ah, there it goes. So the, the, the WebSocket connection was just closed. We are no longer using interactive server rendering, so we can free up those server resources. And then when we browse back to counter again, notice that there's no new WebSocket connections, but the counter still works. How is that possible? Well, that's because in the background, we have downloaded and cached the .NET WebAssembly runtime, so our counter component is now running client-side in the browser on WebAssembly, and it works great. If we look at the weather page, and let's just refresh it, and we'll try and freeze the screen real quick. Here we go. Let's freeze it. There we go. OK, so we can see this loading dot, dot, dot that gets rendered immediately. And then if we let it continue rendering, about half a second later, we get our actual weather forecast data that was streamed down to the browser. Um, there's no WebSockets being used here, no WebAssembly on this page. This is using streaming rendering on the same connection that was established for the uh, initial request. So just a few minutes, we were able to create a Blazor web app that's using all of the new full stack web UI features, uh, static server side rendering, all the page navigations were enhanced navigations, the new interactive render modes, including auto and streaming rendering. Uh, super easy, but really powerful. All right. Now, in addition to full stack web UI support, uh, Blazor also has many other uh, new features and enhancements in .NET 8. QuickGrid is our uh, fast and functional data grid component that makes it easy to display data in a tabular form. It's now part of .NET 8 and supported out of the box. Sections are a way to define outlets for content in one component that can then be filled in by other components. Uh, Blazor, the Blazor router in .NET 8 has gotten lots of improvements. It can now route to named elements, and it now supports uh, route constraints. You can monitor inbound circuit activity for your Blazor server circuits to detect idle circuits. And we've also completely revamped authentication for Blazor in .NET 8 so that you can build uh, and customize a complete identity UI using Blazor components. We've also added a new capability for Blazor components so that you can render Blazor components uh, outside the context of an HTTP request or an ASP.NET Core hosting environment. You can just take a Blazor component and then render it as HTML to a string or to a stream. This is useful if you want to use Blazor components as like a, a, a templating system for generating HTML fragments, like for a generated email. It's also something that's laying the foundation for future support for static site generation in Blazor, which is something that we're looking at and investigating. All right, let's take a look at some of these new Blazor features and enhancements. Let's go back to Visual Studio. And we're going to create another project, another Blazor web app. Looks like a good one. OK. And I'm going to add some additional options to, to this one. In, uh, we're going to add some authentication. We can select individual user accounts to set up our Blazor web app with authentication using ASP.NET Core identity. So let's select that. And then I don't really need WebAssembly for this app, so I'm just going to stick with server-side rendering. We're going to use uh, just the, the server render mode. So we'll go ahead and create this. All right, cool. So now it looks a little bit simpler. We just have a single project. Uh, let's go ahead and run it. We don't have our client project anymore because we're not going to be running on WebAssembly for this application. And this looks like a normal Blazor web app, has home, counter, and weather, but now we've got some additional pages here. This auth required page, if I click on it, I get redirected immediately to the login page because that page requires authentication. It has authorization rules. And we now have an entire authentication UI, identity UI, built with Blazor components. Let's go ahead and register a new user. Let's add a password here. There we go. And I think at this point, I'm going to need to set up my database with the schema for, the, uh, for identity. Yep, so I'll just apply EF Core migrations, click the button, and refresh the browser. Great. So now my user is registered. I can confirm my email account during development by just uh, clicking this link. And we should now be able to log in. Let's see if we can do that. So, and then type my password again. And there we go. OK, so I'm logged in, supposedly. Can I now access that auth required page? I can, and you can see that I'm a logged in user. We also have a full account management UI where we can uh, modify our profile information, change our email address, change our password, set up two factor authentication. This is an entire identity UI solution implemented in Blazor components. Uh, if we look at the code to see how that's done, here in the components folder under accounts, 
pages. There's all of our Blazor components that make up that identity UI. The code is part of the project now, so you can customize it and adjust it to meet your app's needs. So that's how easy it is to set up authentication with a Blazor web app in .NET 8. What should we do next? Let's say now that we want to um, uh, connect to a database and display some data from, from a database. Can we do that? Yes. All right, let's go and let's add a data model to our project. I have an existing um, uh, type that I'm just going to use for this that I typed up previously in my snippets folder over here, this movie type. All right, so this movie type is an EF core data model that has an ID and a bunch of properties to represent a movie. And what I want to do is I want to set up a database that can store my movies. I want to be able to display them, edit them, delete them, you know, basic CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. And to do that, I can just right click on my pages folder and say, let's add a new scaffolded item because we now have on the new Blazor Scaffolder. This is available now with uh, the latest Visual Studio Preview. And this Scaffolder, what it will do is it will allow me to specify a data model, and it will scaffold it out for me, all of those CRUD pages, so I don't have to write any of that code. Uh, we can pick from a set of templates here. If I pick CRUD, that will do all, all of the pages, or I can pick individual pages. Let's do them all. I can then select my data model. I'm going to pick that movie type that I added previously. I then need to specify what DB context I want to use. I can create a new one or use an existing one. I'm going to use the one that came with the template. And let's go ahead and add that. So now Visual Studio will inspect my data model, uh, figure out what its structure is, and uh, generate scaffold for me a whole bunch of CRUD pages that I can use to connect to my database. Generating code. And there it goes. OK, so under Pages now, we have this Movie Pages folder with all my scaffolded pages. Let's go ahead and run the application so we can see what those do. Go back to the web app. OK, so uh, let's browse. I think the, the URL that it generates is slash movies. And initially, ah, it's telling me that, hey, you need to run migrations on your database again for that new movie schema. No problem. We can do that really quick. Let's go to bring up a console, and we'll just add a migration for our movies. I'm just going to call it movies. And then once that migration is generated, we can uh, uh, run update database to apply that migration to our database. There goes EF Core doing its thing. All right, and now back to the web app. Ta-da! Voila! We now have a, a, a pre-built UI for looking at movies. We have a table that shows all our movies. We don't have any yet. So let's go ahead and create one. Let's add a movie. Uh, I don't know. How about ET? I think that was, I looked up the release date for this one. I think it's June 11th, 1982. I think. Uh, all the best movies, by the way, were created in the 80s. Awesome era for movies. Um, this is a sci-fi movie. Price, like let's just imagine I don't specify a price. I'm getting validation on my form. Awesome. I don't know, $8.99, whatever, to make up a price. And then we're able to add a movie to our database. We can see its details. We can edit the movie. Like maybe that price was a little too high. Let's, let's give a discount to folks. And of course, we can delete movies from our, from our database. Awesome. So, and I didn't have to write any code to do that. I was able to easily to connect to some data and display it using Blazor components. That's the new Blazor scaffolder available with Visual Studio Preview. Now, the scaffolder is in preview, but all the code that it generates is fully supported using .NET 8. Let's look at the code that it created. That table that we saw, that's not just a normal HTML table. That is QuickGrid, our, our fast and functional data grid component uh, for Blazor, which means we can do all sorts of fancy things with that table. Like, for example, let's say I want to clean up that release date column, like make the title a little bit cleaner. It's got, it needs a space in it. It's, it's just using the property name currently. So let's set the title here to release date. We'll save that and hot reload that into our app. And then let that update. There we go. That looks better. I also want to format what the release date looks like. So let's add a format string right here. Uh, month, month. Uh, this should do the month, day, and the year. That's good. And we'll go ahead and hot reload that into the application. That should clean that up. There it goes. Uh, what else? We can add sorting. Let's sort the, uh, on the titles. So we'll just say that the title column should be sortable. And we can hot reload that in. Now. This will apply, and I, it's, you can see that the title is now selectable, but when I click it, 
nothing's currently happening. Why is that? Well, that's because by default, this page is using static server-side rendering. It's not, a, it's not enabled for interactivity yet, but we can enable interactivity really easily. We know how to do that now. So let's go to the top of our page and we will add an interactive render mode. Here we're going to use interactive server. Cool, and then we'll go ahead and restart so that that gets applied. I'll give it a second to, to restart. There we go. Um, now we only have one movie. So sorting by one movie is not going to be very interesting. So let's add another one. Uh, I don't know. How about uh, Labyrinth? Another. I don't know what the. I don't know what this, the release date for this one was. We'll just make up one, like 1980-something. Um, this is definitely a movie that gave me uh, some, some nightmares as a kid. I mean, you don't really want David Bowie's hair in your nightmares. Uh, this was, I don't know, Adventure? I don't know what genre it was. And then let's give it a price and add that. OK, so now we have two movies. And if we click on the title, we can sort our movies. Awesome. So if we can do sorting, uh, we can also add uh, pagination support. With that, we just use the built-in paginator component that comes with QuickGrid. Now, the paginator and QuickGrid need to coordinate on the, the pages that should be viewed. And so we just need to create a little state object here. It's going to be a pagination state object. So we'll just initialize that. Imagination state, and then we can specify how many items per page do we want. Well, right now we only have two, so we're going to have one item per page, which I know is a little bit silly, but at least it shows that pagination is working. So we'll add our state object to our paginator, and then we also need to specify it up above for our quick grid. So there's the state, and then we'll go ahead and hot reload that in. OK, and there, now you can see pagination is showing up. We have one page with ET, and then if we go to the second page, we've got Labyrinth, we can sort. This is just some of the things that uh, QuickGrid can do. If you want to see all of its features and capabilities, I recommend heading over to the QuickGrid demo site at aka.ms slash blazer slash QuickGrid. This has a bunch of really awesome QuickGrid examples that shows all of its capabilities. Here's a QuickGrid that has pagination, sorting, but also filtering, like if we want to filter on particular countries and see there. Olympic uh, performance. You can also do virtualization with QuickGrid. Like this is a QuickGrid that's actually rendering you know, 22,000 rows, and it's doing it by only loading the rows as they are visible. So as I scroll, it's loading the the, the data into the QuickGrid and just rendering those ro rows. Um, QuickGrid is out of the box, uh, a easy and simple way for you to display your data and to connect to your databases. All right. Great. So in just a few minutes, we were able to get started with a Blazor web app, uh, add authentication, and connect to data using the Blazor scaffolder, and use the quick grid component to display our data. Now, .NET on WebAssembly also is significantly improved in .NET 8. Uh, your code runs much faster thanks to the new JITterpreter-based uh, runtime. It's a runtime that now has partial JIT support or just-in-time compilation support for WebAssembly. This means your components run 20% faster and JSON deserialization is twice as fast. Hot reload for WebAssembly is also significantly improved. We now support all the same edit types that are supported by the server-based runtime, by core CLR, including the new edit types like being able to edit generic, uh, uh, generic types. Uh, we've enabled uh, WebAssembly SIMD and exception handling support for ahead of time compiled Blazor WebAssembly apps, so they run much faster. Uh, we've introduced a new web-friendly packaging format for .NET WebAssembly apps called WebCIL that makes deployment seamless and painless. And we've also uh, improved our uh, content security policy compatibility so you can really lock down your web apps and make them more secure. Wow, so that's a lot of stuff. So what if, but what if you have an existing web application? How can you start using Blazor in .NET 8 with your existing web apps? Well, there are a bunch of ways that you can do that. If you have an existing Blazor application, it's easy. You just upgrade to .NET 8, and you can start using all the new features. Your existing Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly apps will work on .NET 8 as is, as is without any code changes. You can then choose to also upgrade them to the new Blazor web app patterns uh, if you want to. Uh, we have docs and guidance that show you how to do that. If you have an ASP.NET Core web app, then you can just add Blazor pages alongside your existing endpoints and UI. Blazor is part of ASP.NET Core, so it's designed to compose with all of, the, of, your, of your ASP.NET Core functionality. 
If you're using MVC and Razor pages, you can add Blazor components to your CSHTML files using the Blazor component tag helper. So you can just embed a component right there in your existing app. Uh, for minimal APIs and MVC controllers, we also have a new Razor component result that you can return from your controller actions and from a minimal API to just easily end, uh, uh, render some UI. And lastly, if you have a JavaScript-based web app, you can embed Blazor components in that application as custom HTML elements. And this really works with any web application, uh, like .NET Framework-based web apps, web forms applications. Anywhere you render HTML, you can add a Blazor component as a custom element using open web standards. So no matter what type of web app you're building, you can start using Blazor in .NET 8 with your web app today. There's a really great session coming up on day three of the conference by Ed Charbonneau, where he is going to walk through all these ways that you can integrate Blazor into your existing web apps. You'll definitely want to check that out. Here's a summary of all the new features available with Blazor in .NET 8 full stack web UI, lots of great framework uh, enhancements and new components, and improved WebAssembly support. We hope you're as excited about this release as we are. We invite you to give it a try today by going to blazor.net, where you can find helpful docs and tutorials for getting started. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here at .NET Conf, and we'll be happy to stick around and answer a couple questions.